Honored to be joined tonight on set by Terry Porter and Bucky Buckwalter. Bucky with the Blazers from 76 to 97, NBA's Executive of the Year in 91, the guy that went and found uh, Jerome at Longwood College and also found Terry Porter at Wisconsin Stevens Point. Uh, a lot of traveling. Yeah, yeah. That turned over a lot of rocks. <laughs> That's right. Um, still, uh, it's, it's still surreal and, and, and to, to watch this stuff, and we will continue to do this in the memorial, this, the uh, you know celebration of life is next Monday. Um, Bucky, but I know you've been asked this a lot in, in recent days. What was it about Jerome that you initially saw? Did you – and, and I, mean, I know you were confident in what you saw because you're used to scouting guys, and we've had you on before talking about trips to Europe to find Sabonis and get him over here and these other guys that you, you saw great things in. What were the things that you saw in Jerome that uh, maybe led you to believe he was, he, he was going to make it in the NBA the way he did? Mike, in the early 80s, uh, the Blazers had a lot of skilled players, but we didn't have the great athletes – that we had to play against day after day against the uh, Lakers with Magic and that group. So in my mind, we had to go out and get more athletic. And uh, where we were drafting, we didn't always have a chance to get the best athlete and skilled player. So we decided to get uh, good athletes and hope to, to make them into good basketball players. And the first time I saw Jerome Kersey in 1984 in Portsmouth, Virginia, I said, now there's a good athlete. Portsmouth. <laughs> <laughs> make a break, right? That's right. So I made many a young small guy, small college kids, and gave them an opportunity. It's interesting because uh, in Portsmouth, most of the uh, – Players that went there were drafted in the second round. Others that were projected in the first round went to either Hawaii or later on into Phoenix. But uh, first time I saw Jerome, uh, I said, uh, that is a great athlete. He was very, very competitive. It was a very important thing to win. And he was a team guy. So I said, this is a, a guy that uh, we could fit with at that time. We had Clyde. And, uh, of course, the next year we had you. So we started gaining some athleticism as we went along there. You lost some when you got me, Cole. <laughs> <laughs> if that was next year, it was a different type There's of strategy. A, a, different, a different strategy. A different look. <laughs> Yo, but Bucky, tell us about, though, we, we – we hear about the athleticism, but one of the things about Jerome that, that we're starting to hear more about is he was one of those guys who just went at it every single – there was never a moment. And I know you practiced with him, TP. It doesn't seem like – I know every time I ever played against him, he went 110% every time he stepped on the court. He only knew how to play one way. And uh, you know what? Early in, in the earlier days when it was me, him, um, other guys in that second group, we pushed that first group. He used to go at Kiki every day, and Kiki wasn't ready for it. <laughs> just wasn't ready for that energy that Jerome was bringing. And I'm telling you, it's just one of those guys that just you fed off his energy and how hard he played. And um, I'd said it before, he, he got every – inch of his talent um, when he stepped on the court and he's one of the guys that you know when you le when his career was over he looked back he said I didn't leave anything out there there was no doubt that I, everything I had I left for my 17th year career and he he gave it his all every stop he had Bucky was it in some ways tougher back then to scout I mean these days with the internet and Twitter and all of this stuff and I probably asked you this the last time you were here but it just seems like, you know, in, in some ways there were maybe more gems to uncover maybe single-handedly. Not that you did that in this case, but, it, but how difficult was it to go to small schools and find one? You know, there weren't 10 games on ESPN college games every night, and you, you kind of had to go out and mine these guys and maybe even take bigger shots than some guys take this year. The difficult thing was that uh, in the small college competition, as Terry will tell you, you're playing against – players that are not as good as you're going to be playing against in the NBA, obviously. And to evaluate them against lesser talent, uh, it, it was difficult. You had to rely on a lot of coaches, contacts that you knew that uh, uh, knew what you were talking about when you wanted a good athlete who want, wanted to win and uh, had certain skills. So uh, it was a different time. You used different tools at that time. By the way, in that regard, we were the first uh, team in the NBA that started giving uh, psychological tests to players, which at that time, uh, as you'll remember, Terry. Remember those uh, multiple questions? <laughs> <laughs> multiple choice questions. <laughs> We were the first team, and also uh, Clyde Drexler scored the highest on anyone that ever took that test, and it was regarding coachability, need to win, and uh, uh, competitiveness. So uh, Clyde was a, a good 
right from the start. Good read. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Terry, did you guys think you'd have the, you know, we spent time early on talking to Aaron Aflalo about team chemistry and the importance of it. You guys had such great team chemistry with those early teams. Did you guys think right away, you know, you talked about when he joined the team and the second unit and Kiki and that, that group, and I still remember those those teams you had. Did you know you'd have that kind of chemistry? Did it take a long time to build it, maintain it? Was it difficult or was it just, just to come natural with that group? Well, Bucky would be the first one to tell you that was difficult. I mean, each year we added another piece, and then when you add another piece, then that you have to trust that core and give them time to grow together and um, instill some type of style and identity, and that's what we did. I mean, obviously, Clyde was the first pick and I mean, first selection kind of in regards to the first piece of that team, and then they got, you know, Buck, and then you got Duck, then got myself and got Jerome. So it, it did kind of work itself out during that stretch. We had Kiki, but it had to kind of work itself out. And when we got there, we just at that point, when Jerome, Kiki went down with an injury, and I think Jerome stepped in for him, and we went on like 15-1 stretch, and it just truly was all of a sudden identity was found. We were a team that just went after you, played with the physicality, got out in open court, and had just great finishers around the basket. And you're talking about guys who got out in the wings when you had Clyde on one side and Jerome at the other wing. And if you got between them and the basket, you better be ready. <laughs> All over. They were coming. <laughs> they were coming. And so it was uh, – it, it, it's a little bit different in today's game because of the free agency. You didn't have as much movement, and you had to really trust that you got the right nucleus together, as Bucket can speak on, and trust those guys and give them two or three years and see how that progress, see how the growth comes. And uh, for us, it, it came a lot sooner, I think, than anybody anticipated. Once we got Buck, we got Buck in 89. 89. By the time uh, we had watched Jerome grow in those three or four years, and Clyde uh, said that he wanted to be traded to New York, and I could see by that time that Jerome was ready to take over for him. So we made the trade. Kiki went to New York, and the minute Jerome stepped on the court, it was uh, – an athletic uh, identity, and it was a team that was going to be much more competitive, and you can see that from the first day. Now, talk to me about uh, not just the chemistry, but Jerome's place in the locker room. We all got a chance to see him on the court, you know, and saw what he did uh, on the court every single night and how hard he went. But, you know, for those of us who got a chance to know him, and a lot of fans, you see the smile. And you may think that maybe that's something he gave the fans. That was Jerome Kersey, night in and night out, a big smile on his face. He just enjoyed and embraced being the Jerome Kersey, mercy, mercy, Jerome Kersey. <laughs> no doubt. And when you talk about the locker room, I mean, we all were just like brothers. I mean, it was fun. We joked and went at each other and <laughs> cracked jokes. and uh, But really um, just enjoyed being around each other and enjoyed the process of just being being professional athletes, I mean, and being part of something special, trying to build something special. Bucky, finally, um, we have we all know people in life who are, uh, you know, considered kind of bulldozers, guys that just – and and to, and sometimes the people that kind of have the it factor, the people who have that bulldozer mentality but then are so well-loved across the board. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes when something like this happens, it takes this to find out how everybody – across the league superstars going back years felt about somebody and that should teach us all a lesson i guess about embracing every minute but what is it about jerome that we've heard guys talk about from Shaq and charles and of course we heard from clyde we knew that but that made him so uh, such a warrior on the floor and would rip your head off but so loved by his peers on the floor, you don't want to get in front of Jerome when he's on the open court because he was going to go run right over the top of you. But after the end of the ball game, he would come over, give you a hug and a high five and uh, a big smile, and he was your best friend. And I think that was true uh, with the fans and with the coaches. The coaches loved to work with him because he was so focused. He wanted to improve. And when Jack... Uh, Ramsey told him before he came back to fall camp, we think it'd be best for you. You can't, you're not ready for the NBA. Go to Europe. And Jerome said, no, no, I'm going to come back and I'm going to make your team. He did come back and uh, he not only made the team, he impressed everybody. And uh, Jerome was that way. He was very uh, confident 
a very competitive but a lovable man and we'll certainly miss it bucky we know you got to get out of here we appreciate you stopping by uh always and, and every time you come in i always wonder why we don't have you in more often so <laughs> uh, your place in the blazer legacy is certainly uh you know you help put that team together when i was young growing up watching that team watching terry and jerome and clyde and those guys you were always a guy that we recognized your importance to the franchise so thanks for being here thanks for uh, discovering jerome at longwood college <laughs> we all got to enjoy him not long enough but we did get to enjoy him and we'll see you monday at the celebration of life indeed thank all you right. mike <laughs> and uh, terry porter continues with us antonio harvey flipping through the having a ball cookbook yes i'm a little busy right now the trailbla- <laughs> you guys looking, used to do stuff looking, like this yeah he's looking for his next week recipes to figure out the I, week of what he's gonna have i gotta <laughs> make dinner and i think i've decided i think i've decided on the Blazing blueberry <laughs> coffee cake by Susie Porter. There we go. And uh, Jerome said those are excellent, but there's another. There's another. Um, let's see here. There's another recipe oh. that can be attributed to the uh, Porter family. Up oh, from Molly Kelmer, Brian, Brianna Porter's nanny. They had <laughs> oh. the nannies in here. I mean, they, man, they went all in with the cookbook. There was oh. stuff like that back then. I mean, I don't know if people saw the, saw the front yes. of the cookbook. You can, you can shoot it, John. But, um, you know, that was uh, – that was a, there were really cool stuff ar- around that team, and I mean, I mean, some stuff like this, but a lot of stuff that just kind of organically happened with that group. It was such a special group, not only the, you know, the personalities and the team, but the wives, and you guys had a closeness yeah. that was pretty rare. It it was in regards to things we did off the court, and that was just part of uh, building the bond and um, building the family. I don't. I don't necessarily want to see it on video, but, you know, bust a bucket and (laughs) (laughs) all those other things. We did a a jazz type of night at a gala that the group of guys did that. And so there was a lot of things off the court that we continued to build our teamship and build the family around, which is great. You know, it's, it's super. And you as you play team sports and you become you know, more into each other, more connected to each other. It's things you do off the court that's also so meaningful because you know on the court sometimes it's like work in regards to grinding and grinding. It's nice to get away from that scene and just enjoy each other away from the court. You know, it, it's interesting. Part of the, the – and, and the problem seems to be twofold now, Roman. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Porter, and you, you mentioned it earlier. One, free agency. Guys move around so much yeah. that you can't build those bonds. And mm-hmm. two – uh, guys come in so young. You know, you come in at 19 years old. You're not married. You're not going to be married for another seven or eight years. Yeah, I don't a- know we'd be able to put together a wife. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and, 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 and it's like by the time you're old enough to want to get married, you're 25, 26, 27. You're, in your, you're on your third team a lot of yeah. times. And so you can't build those bonds. But how nice was it? I, I remember coming in, and we had veteran players. James Worthy was over 30. James Edwards was over 30. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sam Bowie was over 30. Sadell Threat, another NAI guy, he was over 30. And they, they brought me in, and immediately me and uh, and Nick Van Exel, they sat us down, and first day, hey, you guys don't do anything without us. We will teach you the way that this game on and off the court is supposed to be done. And, and it just it was so easy to transition into the NBA back then. Yeah, and you talk about the veteran teams. Those teams are so special because they recognize the importance of the young guys. They bring them in, they mentor them, they talk to them about all the situations that they have to deal with, that they're going to be dealing with, with the first year, with family, obviously, and just dealing with off-the-court stuff. And so they, you have now off, almost like an immediate big brotherhood, mm-hmm. you know, in regards they're always there. You always can go to them for anything in regards to what you have in your life that you may need some advice on. Hmm. The Blazer team, uh, you know, back in the, you know, people remember 1992, but it actually started before that and then and, and continued on through that um it it stinks when you talk about you know the events of recent days and and duck and i know that you know with with maurice lucas even can't believe these guys are are gone and and i know you're you're in that same boat um such a special time when i think you know people talk about to this day and we had Aaron Aflalo on earlier, and he talked about this reception by Blazer fans being such a rare thing. The love affair, and clearly they won the title in 77, and Blazer Blazer Mania was born and everything else, but you guys had such a big hand in that. Your team was so loved. And for you to come back now after your coaching days, and, and Jerome, of course, we saw a soundbite of him talking about how he's an Oregonian. What is it about this place, that this fan base that is so special? Well, he hit on it earlier, um, I think, in one of your features. Um, they've embraced us as human beings and as, as sons almost, you know, and, and 
and it's 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 so different than any other city that you go to i mean you can go to other cities where there's great fan support don't get me wrong but the way they embrace you when you go out into the community and the way they embrace you it's just um, you feel their love and you feel um you know how they want you to you know be a part of the community and be a part of the blazer family and it's so special and ask anybody who's ever played here who's obviously you know gone on and play other places they know the difference. And, you know, for us early on, shoot, we had the booster club who used to come to practice and, <laughs> and leave us cookies and stuff afterwards. And my rookie year, funny story, my rookie year, you actually had to go to the booster party and they had actually all the members and you had, it was like a, a gala almost. It was like, you know, I had like two or 300 members in the booster club wow. and you had to go there as a rookie and sit down and they had to ask questions and <laughs> you know they got to know you it, it was it was so different for me I mean it, it reminded me a lot of my college years because you know I went to a small school and we had boosters all the time we had alumni and people that you had to meet and just people who embraced you and so from that standpoint it, it just felt so good and oddly that, enough, that support. the Blazer Booster Club is meeting tonight. He's going to speak to them. Oh, you're more than welcome to nah, come with nah, that's all right. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> right but you tell them I love them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it ain't a personal. It ain't a personal. I feel you now. Have, have you talked to, I mean, obviously you've, you've reached out and have, have probably reminisced some with some f- past teammates uh, and Clyde. Have you guys mm-hmm. shared memories of, of Jerome since uh, the horrible day last week? Yeah, I mean, I reached out to all of them, you know, Buck. Cliff, Mark, um, Danny Ainge, uh, and we have all kind of joked about, you know, fun stories and, uh, and you know, like anybody, we all are shocked. They're shocked. Um, you know, it just um, couldn't believe it. Everybody thought it was some type of uh, just farce or something on it because they, they were tweeting right. it. They were tweeting it out. I couldn't believe I mean, it. Was when really, I got the phone call, that's yeah. the first thing I, no, 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 no. I, I, no, I, mean, I can't have it. It was just, um, you know, it, it was amazing. And um, so, you know, it, it was – it was tough at first, you know, because we just couldn't believe it. We couldn't come to grips with it, uh, what just had happened. And for me personally, you know, I just, good Lord blessed me. I'd just been with him on Tuesday in that school visit, and boom, come Wednesday. And, you know, in a split second, within 24 hours, um, you know, him gone. Good Lord called him. So um, it, it's just it's just it's, it's sometimes it's just unexplainable unexplainable and uh you know but we had fun talking about the old times and talking about drum and uh you know those good old days when when we practiced that uh, him and buck would get after it and him and cliff would get after it, <laughs> get after it so it was uh you know, you know, it, it's funny because that's one of the things that i always heard about jerome was that he played so hard in practice that it become it almost became like antagonistic towards the older guys because you know they don't want to deal with that. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm in my ninth year in the league. I'm a starter. I don't want this young fella coming in here pushing me like that. And but he also made his teammates better. And you spoke to that earlier. And I think I'm looking forward to Monday because I really I'm looking forward to hearing you guys talk about the Jerome Kersey that we never got a chance to know. Yeah, and I, it's gonna be. Um, you know, unbelievable. You know, obviously, you go through life, and this hits everybody hard. And there's some serious grieving. I'll be the first one to tell you. Just, I just couldn't come to grips with it. I couldn't. And um, you know, you get through the grieving part. Now, it's you know, it's about you come to grips with it, and now it's about celebrating who he is and his legacy, and letting people know how really how special he was. Um, you know, teammate, but a, a human being, and just a friend and would do anything for you, and uh, how excited he was about his life, uh, marrying for the first time and the kids. And so uh, now it's about that. It's always about that now and, uh, you know, spreading the, spreading the excitement about exactly. uh, the joy. his journey and uh, how uh, how he just, you know, his story's unbelievable. His story's amazing when you think about where he came from and what he was able to achieve. we got about a minute left, but um, I asked Bucky this. The national outpouring from all the guys he played with and, and current players and, you know, Kobe tweeting and LeBron, he impacted a lot of people. Yeah. And, and like I said, sometimes you don't know that until somebody's gone, unfortunately. Well, you know what it's like when you play in a sport like this. It's, it's about your peers' respect. That's what everybody Absolutely. tell me. At the end of the day, when you hang them up, you know, you want to have your peers' respect and have them appreciate your body of work and what you did and how you went about it. And I don't think there's anybody who's ever came across that guy on the basketball court <laughs> felt that he didn't give it everything, everything he got. And, you know, 
some nights guys just wasn't ready for him. You wasn't ready for it, you was going to lose that night because <laughs> he was going to bring that energy every night, and, and, and that's he, what's so special about him. And as an opponent, I can tell you, you were never <laughs> you were never ready for it. You were never ready for what he brought. Terry, I know it was tough, but it was a blessing to all of us, believe me, and to Blazer fans to have you here and to hear your voice through a lot of this. Uh, Thank you, Embiid. Really, Appreciate uh, it. I mean, I, it honestly, was hard to be in, in I know. the public eye to do it. But. No, I know, but you handled it perfectly. You're authentic, like Jerome, and you guys cut from the same cloth in that regard. So thank you. Uh, we'll see you Monday, the celebration of life, 4 o'clock at the Coliseum for Jerome Kersey. For Antonio Harvey, I'm Mike Barrett. Good night. Thanks for watching and listening, everybody.